So hey everyone, we're so, so glad you're here tonight for our very first Seattle Women in Design event. In the coming year, you can anticipate a series of Women in Design events that'll be coming out of uh, Seattle, interspersed with our core IDSA events that you've come to know and love. Um, for any of you that attended the national conference, um, it was a pretty magical experience of community building and connection. Um, so following that, a couple months ago, I approached Seattle's IDSA board with a request that we work on creating the same experience here for our local community. And luckily was met with a lot of enthusiasm and support from all of them. Um, we're really happy to be growing this area of focus and we really look forward to the way it strengthens our connection with all of you and we start to build a community that really is supporting women out here in Seattle. Um, some quick housekeeping for the event. We have two really wonderful speakers. I'll introduce them to you in a moment. Um, we're going to hear from them back to back and then at the very end of the event, open up the floor for a Q&A. Feel free to drop your questions into the chat when they occur to you or hold them until the end and then drop them in there. Um, everybody's mic seems to be turned off. We appreciate that. Um, if you do feel comfortable having your camera on, that would be really fun so we can just get to know your faces and feel like we're there with you. Um, but this is recording, so if that makes you uncomfortable in any way, you know, no worries, we totally understand and are still happy to have you here. Um, yeah, other fun stuff I mentioned earlier, feel free to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, um, if you're in industrial design or another type of design industry, um, what brought you here and, and you know, what made you wanna be part of this tonight. Um, alrighty, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Claire Duffy. Hello, I am going to share my screen. <laughs> All right, Claire. Okay. And okay. Hello. Thank you, Kate. Um, I am Claire. And before getting started, want to give everyone at IDSA Seattle chapter um, the biggest thank you for putting on the event and to Kate and Ginger for your hard work in coordinating. I'm honored to be speaking. Um, sorry, I'll start with a little background. Uh oh, it won't let me click. Okay, there we go, it'll let me click. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I'll start with a little background before diving into tonight's theme. How do you cultivate a source for your creativity? Um, I moved from Boston to Washington to work on Precor's product development team as an industrial designer a little less than three years ago. Uh, but way back when, my parents met in the Navy. My father was a search and rescue swimmer, and he jumped out of the H-46 helicopters that my mother worked on as an airman and an electrician. So what that meant is we bounced around a lot. Um, I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, before we moved to California. To Claire? Switzerland. Yeah? I'm very sorry, but can you close the colors toolbox that you have? I think, I, um, I think it would... What toolbox is that? There's oh, a color. Okay. okay, yeah, I didn't even realize that was visible. Awesome. Thanks so, for letting me know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, is that okay? Are we good? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we moved around a lot. Um, I was born in Norfolk, Virginia, before we moved to California, Squim, back to California, Jacksonville, Virginia Beach, Leonardtown, Maryland, and then I moved to Boston, Massachusetts before coming to Washington to complete the loop. Um, being regularly relocated to strange environments as a kid isn't really something you grow to appreciate until you're quite a bit older. With one parent on deployments and the, and the, and the other one independently raising two children and a big Rhodesian Ridgeback, you develop a sense of service and sacrifice before you really realize you should also have a sense of self to go along with it. Um, because of the potential to impact many people's lives in ways big and small, I pursued industrial design in college. Uh, while my post-college, I had a post-college existential flounder between getting by and working places I thought I was supposed to be, I realized 
that wanting to help people wasn't enough of a direction to really know where to steer your career. Um, a year out of school, things weren't really going the way I'd imagined. And in an attempt to establish control in my life, I began learning to box. Um, competing taught me how to call upon the lessons in resilience, adapting, being flexible as things change around you that I'd learned earlier in life. And at the same time, forced me to develop skills that would later help in designing, like planning and resp responding to what's happening, um, making up your mind and quickly committing to decisions, and most importantly, accountability for results. Um, I've been lucky to experience a huge breadth of categories of design because I've kept an open mind, some of them being costume design, display design, graphics and visual language, packaging, user interface design, and um, sports goods are just a few of the things I've had the opportunity to experience. Um, it took me eight years living in Boston for me to kind of accept that I'm not a very good New Englander. And looking at the job description at Precor, on the surface, it seems like a natural fit simply because I love working out and it's a fitness company. But what really sold me was the statement um, we develop, was the mission statement, our mission statement. We develop personalized health and fitness experiences that help people live the lives that they desire. Um, and to me, that meant all athletes, all people, senior citizens, everybody. Um, and learning more about Precor, the company seemed genuinely to value employees, customers, and users um, because it didn't cater to a sp specific niche level of fitness or category of people. And that's true. Our fitness equipment goes into boutique clubs, box gyms, colleges, even Coast Guard boats, and the YMCA. Um, when designing, you're balancing the needs of many individuals. Uh, what if the user is blind is a question we answer by walking through cases for interaction cases where blind people or people with physical impairments or disabilities may be using treadmills and fitness equipment. Things like headphone jacks, while designers might feel like they're becoming outdated, are still valid because not everyone can afford Bluetooth headphones. Um, we believe accessibility is really important. So back to tonight's question, how do you cultivate a source for creativity? And personally, there are two ways. One is range, thinking about the ways to alter knowledge from previous experiences so that it can be applicable to the new challenges you face. And perspective, to forget your own perspective, to see the problem through somebody else's. An example of when I've used range is with goal setting. Uh, I never, really understood what it meant to plan and work towards a goal until I was in a gym environment. And now that I do, making consistent progress in every area of life seems achievable. For example, in lifting, uh, say you have a 170 pound back squat and by the end of the year, you want a 200 pound back squat. It's simple math. Over 12 months, that's about two and a half pounds a month. And to get there at three months, you have to be at 178. And if you're not, you have to figure out what you need to change about your game plan um, to get you to your goal or to assess the path you're on and create new goals that are more achievable. Um, another instance where range has helped me immensely is learning effective ways of communicating. For anyone that might not be familiar, the book Lean In describes situations in which women are holding themselves back in the workplace and encourages us to be more assertive, putting ourselves at the table. Um, I fumbled around a lot with this, trying to figure out what it means to sacrifice likability for success. And in hindsight, we know this thinking is flawed as it places the responsibility for success on individual women without taking into account the societal structures that are around us. And it wasn't until I scrapped all of that and began applying what I'd learned in books on romantic relationships to my professional relationships that I started to see the change I'd been seeking. Things like active listening, le listening techniques, uh, asking questions with the intention of understanding and focusing on positive commonalities and overlap rather than areas where you disagree with somebody um, and figuring out how to implement these techniques in professional settings, I finally began to feel like I was making progress. 
To jog creativity, you use your range of experiences to develop a variety of solutions. After developing all those possibilities, you assess what is viable by considering the problem through other perspectives. Using fitness equipment as an example, you can view the problem you're solving through the lens of an industrial designer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, or even go outside of product development to see things through the perspective of a salesperson or a person on the manufacturing line. And then on top of that, it's who you're solving for, customers or users. Shifting the importance of different constraints can help you change your focus and jog creative, um, innovative design solutions. A fitness, equi fitness equipment can be really complicated, but the first thing I ever designed at Precore was a single step. Uh, grateful to not be thrown into the deep end and with a even with a surprising number of constraints for a single step, uh, I was confident that I could do it until the head engineer asked, shouldn't there be a leveling foot? And I was just like, no and explain that none of our competitors have one. And he very astutely replied, but we wanna be better than our competitors, don't we? And we do. So I just said, okay, I'll think about it and sat there stewing at my desk for a while in a mild panic, uh, thinking about how I was going to model a perfectly square box on a perfectly level platform so that we could test whether or not we needed a leveling foot. When the heavens opened up and a man named an engineer named Tom, who is wonderful, <laughs> brought me a book open to a page that put the issue to rest. And I learned in that moment that that particular head engineer had just finished looking at stair climbers, which are huge, heavy pieces of commercial fitness equipment full of tubing and mechanisms, which need leveling feet. Um, the page Tom showed me illustrated an elementary rule of mechanical design describing elastic constraints, which essentially means increasing rigidity by adding flexibility. And as long as we didn't over constrain the box by adding support structures in more than one direction, the box would retain enough flexibility for all four corners to contact the floor. So in the end, we were both right. There could be some circumstances in which we would need a leveling foot, and it was my job as the designer to make sure the design was simple enough that we would not. Um, like that. <laughs> Sometimes I'll explore what the product would look like if we were to only address a singular issue. And then as you answer those separate design problems and you collect these separate elements, you can, over, you can find overlap in what's required to make each element successful. And this creates a space for innovation that the whole team gets excited about. Uh, believe it or not, listening to other disciplines talk about what they find important and considering that in your design helps colleagues feel listened to and they love it. This cultivates camaraderie around executing your specific design intent and leads to healthy and cooperative understanding where it's appropriate to compromise. Um, being able to acknowledge that two very different truths can exist simultaneously would help me a lot going into 2020. As the year unfolded, the world got to see how the colonial matri matrix of power has allowed institutionalized racism and injustice to, cont to continue to thrive in the United States. In response to this glaring reality, Precourse Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Council was created. Um, I am the co-chair of the communication branch of the council and focus primarily on the expansion of tools and processes used to assess, address, and prevent bias and discrimination within our internal corporate culture. Um, as women in design and women in tech, most of us can look around us and see why there's a need for groups and councils like this. In my entire career, I've never had the privilege of working with another woman on a team of industrial designers and to go a step further, honestly can't recall ever seeing a black woman employed at any place I've ever worked. There is an obvious multi-layered accessibility issue here. And while I don't have the time to elaborate on the complexities of this problem today, it is important to state that the bare minimum we need to be doing is giving and sharing our opportunities, platforms, and resources with the brilliant black women we know that are striving every day, doing meaningful work and uplifting those around them continuing to give to a society that gives nothing in return. And that has to change. And we're the ones that are responsible for changing it. Like many industrial designers, Wendy Moma Michelle Dupu, Dupu excuse me, is a multidisciplinarian, 
having studied strategic design and management at Parsons. And in addition to being an exquisitely talented artist herself, she's the founder of MindArt, a, a creative wellness group which uses the language of art to transform people. She has developed a progression and exercise which enables artists, designers, and businesses to help get our overthinking minds out of the way when it comes to cultivating sources for creativity. As someone who's never really been comfortable thinking of myself like as a brand, I hired MoMA for social media and marketing consultation in preparation for this talk. And I was completely blown away by her poignant observations her ability to distill a lot of information into understandable, actionable processes that you can execute on. And she left me completely invigorated and excited about the steps ahead. And I'm going to use the remaining bit of my time to share some of her work with you. Hey everyone, my name is Wendy Moma Michelle Dupu, uh, creative director and founder at MindArt. Um, at first, I just want to say thank you to Claire for extending the opportunity and extending your platform so that I can speak and share a little bit about the research that I've been developing over the past decade, um, but with more intention in the last five years. MindArt is a creative wellness group that uses the language of art to transform people. Uh, it is a mix of neuroscience, psychology, um, art therapy, and brand strategy fused together to develop a three-step process that artists and brands can go through in order to um, get out of their mind and into their art and uh, access the tools that they have within themselves to be fully sustainable, whether it's a business, whether it's a brand, whether it's an artist. Uh, my personal background as a visual artist and digital brand strategist uh, forced me along a path where I was exploring almost every single medium that um, that I was that I was given, whether it's painting, dancing, digital marketing, uh, creative directing, recording, filmmaking. I found that the consistent thread between all of my mediums was myself. I used this uh, same exact trajectory to explore mental health when I was suffering um, from a series of depressive episodes. Um, during that time, I was led to make and create art. And the work that I did evolved into uh, from one line drawing and into the platform that you see here. Um, within the first year of showcasing the work that I was putting together for um, my art show and for mind art, I noticed that the art was beginning to be used as a language to talk about very difficult conversations such as depression and, and, and anxiety and suicide. At my um, final art show in 2017, I sat and I said, okay, what if art could be used as a tool to help um, communities create more impactful dialogues on mental health? and the importance of mental health. Um, simultaneously, while exploring how this, this art making and this art process and this expressive art therapy can help the minds of artists, I was also able to bring my practice um, to help brands and businesses alike. Businesses that have um, meaning, businesses that want to impact and inspire globally, I've been able to meet um, intimately with their founders and with their team and apply a holistic way and a holistic method to digital brand strategy that instead of um, brands and businesses alike looking to find uh, something different to show to their audience. What is it within them? What is it within their niche? What is it within their why that we can actually help pull out and properly mirror to the digital space? So we're no longer pretending um, when it comes to digital media. Instead, we're just mirroring, mirroring the impact that you have in the real world so that it could be reflected in the digital space. So let's talk about MAS, mind mapping, mind art, and mind share. Mind mapping is equivalent to an expressive art therapy where we have these sessions with our artists or our brands, the equivalent to strategic consultations. We take our insights and we turn it into power. Mind art is a collection that comes out and that collection can be in the form of an interview, that collection can be in the form of a, um, a piece of artwork that you're sharing. It is a full campaign that we activate our customer service team and we, it may be a rebranding of some sort, it may be um, a new album for an artist. Once the mind art is created, we go into mind share. Mind share allows us then to 
explore and release what has been created to the masses in a way that is authentic and true to you. Once we're done with Mindshare and your collection is out to the public, um, then we are here to help manage and keep that consistency. And so, so far we've gone, we've worked with three brands and three artists working them through um, MAS. And we are in the, our first year launching our artists in residency program, which has, allows us to really share our findings and our insights and strengthen our research for more artists where we can provide them with studio space, where we can provide them with funding, access to mental health counseling and nutrition plans. And for the course of, for over the duration of six months to a year, we're able to see if an artist or a being who was put into this kind of incubator, it can radically change themselves in order to radically change the world. Because we believe here at Mind Art, the, the healthier the mind of the artist, the healthier the world, because the artist is the sentient of the world. And if we can put out, um, release our traumas and bring back into the world hope and possibility and cur curiosity and change, then we do believe that we can live in a better society. So um, thank you so much. If you would like to donate to our company or would you, or you, if, or if you would like to be a part of our fundraiser, you can head over to www.metamindart.org and learn a little bit more about what we're up to. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Oh. So that was MoMA. And as I said, um, in a consultation with her to kind of prepare, for this talk, uh, I had never really, as a designer, had never thought of myself as someone who would do put all of that on Instagram. And she was really good at um, boiling down what is important to you as an individual, connecting it to what you're doing at work. So somewhat unlike an artist, industrial designers have a very specific kind of work routine versus what we do outside of work, which can sometimes be designed, but isn't always. And she made everything seem so much more inspiring and achievable in terms of helping you reach your goals in a really practical way when it comes to figuring out how to market yourself as an individual. But to wrap this up, uh, from my perspective, uh, the best way to jog creativity is to forget yourself for a moment and look through someone else's eyes. Understanding the layers of complex problems will help you be a more versatile designer and helps you create tools that you can use the rest of your life. Um, just be liberal about where you use them. And thank you very much again to IDSA Seattle chapter for having me today. And I will now be passing the torch to Kay Kim. Thanks so much, Claire. That was really fantastic. I'm sure you sparked a lot of conversations and questions that we can have at the end. Um, my one person applause kind of sat on Zoom. <laughs> um, all right, and now we're gonna turn it over to Kay Kim. Can you guys all see my screen? Yep. Yeah, hello, everyone. Yeah, okay. Cool. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kay Kim, and I'm an industrial designer currently working at Starbucks here in Seattle. And happy late New Year to everyone. Um, some of you may have seen my talk at the IDSA Woman in Design last year. And if you did, you all know how much I love to use GIFs in my presentations, too. You'll probably see a plenty of GIFs in my presentation. Um, but I just wanted to say that I'm very thankful that I, we all survived 2020 and stayed healthy to be here tonight and kicking off this wonderful Women in Design Seattle chapter. So when I first saw the topic for this talk, how do you cultivate a source for creativity? I was like, ooh, source for creativity. And so I was like, first started to think about what are my creativity sources in my head. And I was like, Oh, this should be pretty easy topic to talk about and craft my presentation because like all of you guys, probably most of you guys, we're designers. We all have good idea what our creative sources are and because we use them on a daily basis. So I start to brainstorm on what my creative resources are. And of course, I'm accompanied by my creative juice here called Scotch. And then I'm having my Thursday cheers here right now too. <laughs> and I start to list out my creativity sources. 
And I realized when I was younger or a student, I think most of my creativity sources come from more literal creative fields such as you know art, music, and movies. But then as I start to work as a designer, I start to get more inspired by people and their point of views and their various experiences they had in the past lives. So, and then of course in 2020, and as I'm getting older every year, I think my big chunk of creativity source actually start to come from more emotional or situational buckets like failure, achievement, challenge, or change. And of course, here and there, there's always that random light bulb that pops up and out of nowhere in your life that becomes a surprise creative source. So really, it almost became an infinite laundry list of sources. So I felt good and I was like, oh, maybe I can choose a few and elaborate on it. And I was ready to actually start crafting my presentation and storytelling. So I kind of revisited and reread the topic for this talk. How do you cultivate a source for creativity? And I was like, what do you mean, how do you cultivate for a source for creativity? And I was like, wait, how do I, how do I cultivate a source for creativity? So, and then I realized that most of the times people talk about or ask about what are your creativity sources? What are your inspirations? And where do you get those inspirations for, uh, from? And we rarely ask someone, how do you cultivate those sources? And what are your cultivation tools? And to be honest, this question very, was very interesting and refreshing yet challenging. And I had no answer to this question and I was really stuck. So in the end for me, preparing for this talk actually became a source for my self-reflection opportunity for me to really figure out what are my own cultivation tools so that I can actually give this talk right now. And then I went to sleep at 6 a.m. So I'm kind of buzzing up. Um, so after spending lots of time reflecting on myself, I came up with my big three creativity sources based on my experiences. And from that, I was able to define how I cultivated the creative sources, which I'm going to share today. Um, so the first creativity source I'm going to talk about is capacity. So did you know that human brain's capacity is petabytes? And I'm like, who doesn't think about petabytes all the time? And am I right? And sorry, I love that jokes. But it means uh, 2.5 million gigabytes. And it is equivalent to that we can store about 4.7 billion books in our brain. And I think I only you know, store three books total. Um, but this is what my brain looks like when I'm not working on, and I'm not utilizing my 4.7 billion book capacity. And mostly thinking about food, petting my dog, and tiny bit of action exercise when I'm kind of too lazy. Um, and then when I'm working, my brain capacity seems to get filled a bit more, and then content seems to be more focused on work-related topic, and very important questions such as, which virtual background should I choose for today? Um, and then when it comes to a crunch time, and then I need to get ideas as soon as possible, but can, can cannot come up with an ideas or concepts. This is what my brain usually looks like, and it is full of my desire to come up with new ideas under stress and the pressure and leaving almost no room in my brain. And in my experience, I rarely get ideas in these situations. And this reminds me of a junior year in college at UW where one of our ID project was to design a modular kinematic product. So it was a kind of like a, um, um, a class time and I couldn't come up with any cool concepts or ideas. And I basically had nothing to show during our class critique. And I was under pressure and huge stress. And to the point I was like, well, flip the shit. I gave up, I'm just gonna run away. And maybe I can tell my professor I need to go to the you know, bathroom and don't come back until the class ends. And once I decided that I'm going to give up, I just, my brain started to turn into this and kind of empty out with the one feeling, which is run. And so I kind of wandered around the hallway, kind of got out of my classroom, and then I kind of decided to go to Woodshop, and I was like, oh, maybe I can pretend that I'm making a model for my concepts to my professor. 
So I kind of grabbed my wood block and then just kind of start, started chopping on the um, chop saw. And then after making a few uh, wood blocks, I was like, oh, maybe I can make free Jenga for myself to play. And then after cutting like 50 of them, I was like, oh, maybe I should tape them so I can store them somewhere. But as I was taping and this accident discovery happened, and somehow the way I taped them hinted me that I can utilize the tape hinge to connect these blocks and create a cool moving blocks. And then I repeated the same attachment and ended up creating this kinematic toy at the end. And this is one of my favorite student projects still because it is simple fun, and really tells a good story that sometimes you know, ideas comes when you are least expecting. So this incident really made me think about you know, maybe there are always great ideas and greatest ideas that surround our heads. And, but we tend to fill our capacity when we're in the need of coming up with great ideas. And as a result, maybe it's not that we cannot come up with an idea, but maybe sometimes we just need to make a room for the ideas, whether that is a desired or accidental or total random to come in. So, I think we all have a capacity to come up with the great creative ideas, but how we cultivate those ideas is by letting go and letting in. So next creativity source I want to talk about is awareness. And I'm sure a lot of you are friends and family. I know Amy, you're allergic to nuts, <laughs> peanuts. Um, uh, besides doing an allergy test, we usually discover our allergy in a more organic way. For example, I eat dinner with my family and friends, and then I kind of get allergic reaction, each feeling. So I kind of note some of the food that were specific and keep that in mind for future reference. And when this repeats and when you get more insights and you're more aware of this happening, you finally know what you react to and how you react to. You finally find you're allergic to something. And this results in you exactly knowing what to do and exactly know what not to do. And in the end, you get to know what yourself better and also be happier. So really, if you grow your awareness of what you react to and how you react to, just like an allergy, it creates a shortcut to have the best outcome for yourself. And I think this sounds more methodological or equation-y, but I think this also applies to creativity. Like I mentioned before, we all have an infinite laundry list of creative source, but the more you get exposed and repeat, you kind of have a selection of your top creative sources over time. But also within those top lists, sometimes you realize that you get more inspired by one than the other based on your previous uh, reactions and experiences. So for example, both art and fashion are equally powerful, but when I need some visual inspiration and I tend to get a spark of an idea faster and better when I watch a fashion show runway. For example, this is the latest Prada menswear fashion show. Not that I can afford this, but it is a really good combination of thinking of space, music, people, textile and designers vision all in place running live, which is fascinating and super complex. So when I need some visual reference, instead of going to art, I tend to find fashion because I know I react to that and then spark some ideas faster and better. And also I think a lot of people find books as one of their biggest creativity sources. But personally, I hate reading books and I rarely read books. And I, I think I only read when it's, I need to fall asleep and I need to cure my insomnia. Um, but on the other hand, I love reading quotes and short and sweet. And this book called The Ultimate Quote of Einstein is one of my favorite books that live in my, you know, petabyte, petabyte brain. And it's been more than like five years since I bought this book. And after reading this over and over, utilizing this book, um, I learned to use this book as a shortcut tool to bring me a creativity spark. So when I'm having the mental block and uh, my brain is in full capacity, I leave that space and then screw it and then I grab this book and I randomly choose a page to open and then I read the very first quote that I see off the page. And very interestingly, this quote seems to always spark a good question mark in my brain that sometimes answers to what I was looking for 
whether the quote is super related or completely unrealist, unrelated topic. So for me, uh, really being aware of what I react to and how I react to really became a really useful learning. So when I'm stuck, like when I was crafting this presentation in the beginning, uh, instead of waiting and struggling to get an idea, I go to my creativity source that I know I react to the best. And so I could get what I'm looking for faster and earlier and then more effectively. Or if I don't find it from the first one, I decide to uh, go to different source that I know that are effective. So I think awareness is one of the most important sources in general. And the way you could turn this into creativity source is simply knowing what turns you on. And then maybe uh, you know a shortcut to your creative faster. And my last creativity source is a struggle that we all have. Um, you know, sometimes no matter how much you empty your brain capacity or use your best Jericho tool and then read thousands of Einstein quotes, um, there are moments where I feel lost, um, helpless, and unmotivated. And I think a lot of times it's because I feel very happy and content when my life is balanced well. And suddenly this box from a dark side appears and drops and complete break and shatter the happy balance. And it makes me sad, struggle, unmotivated and uninspired. And this happens all the time. So I was like, how can I find my balance back maybe easier, quicker, faster, more effectively, you know, same as how I use my Einstein book. And at the end, I was like, oh, maybe it is something really simple. And maybe one way is to simply put a counterweight on the opposite side and find your balance back. So as one of the example, a few years ago, I felt very burnt out from work and work started to become just work. And then my desire to become the you know, best designer, creative designers actually started to become, oh, I wanted to get a good paycheck and good vacation. So when I was feeling the burnt out, I was like, okay, I need a creative escape. So I put a counterweight of creative escape and then I created a burning room. So for my burnt out. <laughs> and then at the end, I kind of created this illustration series called Silent Lines, which got a huge exposure uh, after Stefan Segmeister posting on his Instagram, which also led me to an opportunity to work with an Apple uh, iPhone inventor Imran to work for his uh, new company that he found uh, called Humane. But there's another story that I want to specifically talk about for this topic. Um, several years back, I was going through a quote-unquote <laughs> quarter-life crisis and I was feeling unhappy, unmotivated about work or anything. So I tried to make myself more motivated, maybe exercise, it didn't really last long, but I didn't watch an inspiration movie, hang out with friends, etc. cetera. Um, but this became a temporary solution and the problem didn't, problem didn't really seem to go away. So I love philosophy, probably you guys all know by now, um, but I started to ask myself, what is happiness? What makes you happy? And how do you make yourself happier? And around that time, I started this blog on my portfolio called Wonder Around the Wonders. And it's basically where I post a bunch of random ideas or kind of do side projects, and et cetera. And this was the framework that I used. So whenever I have that question mark moment, like a huh, and I kind of uh, react with my ideation. And after that, I kind of refine and execute that into a solution. But I think this three first three steps are very common in the workplace. So what I wanted to do is push myself and then really figure out, okay, is there anything else? Is there more to it? So it can be a wow effect. So I started to tackle my happiness problem actually with happiness and put a counterweight to balance it out. So my whole moment was throwing this question at myself. Can happiness level go up once you start being happy about small little things in everyday life? And I did some research and gave a thought and came up with this three insights. These days we are becoming a master of multitasking. So for example, like I'm getting a text message but my Instagram is pinging me and then my DoorDash is ringing me that my delivery is almost here while I'm listening to music and a YouTube, uh, watching YouTube. 
So we became the master of um, a short span multitasking, but this actually resulted in us reacting to stuff than reflecting. And because of this phenomenon and more uh, customer behavior and then people behavior, we start to give less meanings to the meanings that we actually need to care. So we care more about like button and not care about our own mental health, for example. And also looking at my families and friends, I noticed that how we find the meaning of happiness also varies. So for example, like a younger people, including myself, we often say, I have so many things to do, but I don't have enough time. And this actually leads to a less reflection time and which also leads to you kind of forget the meaning of happiness because you don't really reflect that much. On the other hand, the older population, they have, I don't have a lot to do, but I have lots of time. And this leads to a more reflection time and which often lets you to redefine the meaning of happiness. And then if you don't know your meaning of happiness, it leads to your unhappiness. So really what makes it happiness? So to tackle this problem and also to tackle my own happiness problem, I decided to kind of execute this pro concept project called Project 3. And it is not a revolutionary innovation. It is, it is not just a book. And it is just a book that simply uses a ritual practice to change behavior. So what it is about is, so you spend 30 minutes every day thinking about three things. So the first thing is, the thing that you shared or gave on that day. The second is you are thankful of. And then the third one is you learned something you discovered and received. And if you really think about it on the, the white page, if you consider yourself as that a diamond shape, by completing each step, it goes come and go in an infinite loop and then completes who you are by also giving others and then being thankful and then also getting something. So my kind of philosophy was like, you are not complete yourself unless you share. And then if you share, you have to be thankful. And then if you're thankful, then you will automatically uh, fill in that gap that you, that became a gap by you sharing. Um, so the first page is like a begin, you kind of record your day and then you kind of record your happiness level. And I kind of uh, purposely um, kind of left out your, you know, gender, your age, your marital status or occupation, because I was thinking um, those factors should not define how happy you are. Um, and then each page kind of goes like this, repeating, recording each three points and the end. And then at the end, you kind of record your happiness level again. And you kind of get to compare like how your happiness kind of change or didn't change um, by practicing this ritual. And after this, I was like, okay, maybe I need to do uh, something more and then come up with this plus sign. And then I realized that the happiness doesn't really matter unless you share it. And that's how it gets bigger and then impactful. So I wanted to do this into a social impact and maybe a 30% donation and kind of start to do like, oh, maybe I can make a website and a Kickstarter fund and then create this uh, um, business platform and even think about um, the purchasing and pricing platform. And so the happiness is contagious and spread through. And at the end of this, it didn't make me drastically happy, but it really encouraged me to think that happiness could come from a small little things. And so really how you could cultivate a creativity from struggle is by putting a counterweight to elevate and find that balance back. So those were my big three findings and cultivation tools that I discovered. But then I was like, I was like something is missing. And then I forgot that I was missing the most important creativity source and cultivation tool, which is an exchange. So I don't know if you know August de Los Reyes, but I met August briefly when he taught one of the design foundation classes in my sophomore year in college. And hearing his passing last month was really heartbreaking, but it really made me think of how much impact he has left me, even though it was a really brief moment. And you probably noticed that I love to use GIFs and lots of slides and make presentation more dynamic as I try to. Um, 
And really this inspiration came from when I first saw August's introduction presentation on the very first day of his class in sophomore year. I was mind blown that one can tell a story in a such dynamic, engaging and humorous way. And it really changed how I view presentation and then the power of storytelling. And it really influenced me and encouraged me so much to tell my stories to other people so hopefully it sparks an inspiration to the listeners like I was by seeing August's talk. And hopefully those listeners also continue to inspire others. So, and really uh, it made me realize that all this creativity source doesn't really matter if it is not shared. And because creativity is contagious and to keep us all, all creative, it should be passed on. So my last finale cultivation tool that I forgot to include as part of my top three is to get creativity source by exchanging is we all should try to be a rainbow in someone's cloud. So there's rainbow everywhere, wherever you look for. Um, thank you. Wow. Well, I can definitely say that both of you speakers took that brief and ran with it beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I'm feeling really uh, inspired and hopeful, and I'm sure a lot of our guests are too. Thank you so much. Um, now I just really want to open it up. Um, if anybody has questions that they wanted to follow up with for Claire or Kay or both, um, you can feel free to unmute yourself or you can drop it in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. I have one I can share if we need it. Okay, let's kick it off with that. So I noticed that both you, Claire and Kay, talked a lot about the importance of letting go in Kay's case or forgetting yourself in Claire's case. Why do you think it's so important to have kind of that blank open space in your creative process? I can go first. Um, I think, as I mentioned in my presentation, I think it's a really, it comes down to really a simple equation. If you want something, then you have to make a room. And if you're full, then there's no room to fill in. And then I think it works in, you know, life or happiness or work or any kind of satisfaction. So I think it's really very fundamental, you know, law that answers the question. Um, I guess from my perspective, the way I interpreted the question, I guess, and the prompt was, if you, if you need to cultivate a source for creativity, it's because you, in that moment, aren't really having it. So in my mind, that means you're stuck. And if you're stuck, you have to back up a little bit to unstick yourself. And if in your, your current mindset, in, in your current perspective, you're stuck, then you kind of have to forget where you're at a little bit to unstick yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. We got a question from Maria K. How do you find the right counterweight to a struggle? The right counterweight? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, if I... If I knew the right counterweight, I wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> um, I think um, I think there's no right or wrong counterweight. I don't want to be like too philosophical here, um, but I think it's just kind of trying and kind of leverage, you know, the room. And sometimes it doesn't work, so maybe you have to try it again and then try a different one and then kind of which see which balances off. Or if you think about the balance, like the weight, and then you have to match to the weight, and maybe it's not just the one thing that counterbalance the other one. And maybe it is like a combination of, of you know, 10 small counterweights that balance. So maybe that's how I view and can answer to that question. Yeah, 
That makes a lot of sense to me too, I think. Um, Claire, now we have one for you from Laura. She said, Claire, you mentioned that when you were first starting out in your career, wanting to make a difference wasn't enough or wasn't enough direction. Could you extrapolate on that thought? Yeah, of course. So depending on your mindset, anything you could do could be making a difference in some capacity and which is awesome, right? The, the way people um, are happy at work is to find meaning in their work and have to believe that they're making some sort of difference, whether you're a doctor or a janitor at a hospital, um, what you're doing is helping people stay healthy and saving lives. So from in the context of industrial design specifically, you could design a blender and say you're helping people um, simplifying their morning routine so that they, they have more time throughout the day and their life is better. And that's one way of making a difference or um, designing fitness equipment so that people can work out and live the life they desire. That's another way of making a difference. So with the right mindset, you can apply making a difference to nearly anything. Um, and that's why I found myself feeling like that wasn't enough and that I had to figure out a little bit more about myself and what I enjoy to figure out where I would be happy long term, if that makes sense. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Wonder if any of the other board members are curious to ask a question. Yeah, Herman. Yeah, I've got a question, but I'm still trying to figure out how to ask it. So <laughs> first of all, thanks so much. You guys, both of you are so prolific. And, and so being such successful women designers, um, I wanted to better understand from it from an industry standpoint, how do, what's your advice? Like what's working really damn well that you would, you wanna share with us of how do we continue to drive and amplify your creativity? Um, especially if it relates to women, like how do we celebrate women strong, just like yourselves um, even more? Um, I think that something I think the mentality of individuals in the workplace um, and accepting that men and women in terms of the way that we behave are inherently different and celebrating those differences um, rather than expecting women to behave more like men in a lot of different instances would be a really great way of kind of making more room for women in different industries and being an ally. Um, as it relates to creativity, Honestly, men and women are kind of in the same playing field when it comes down to skills. It's just a matter of access and acknowledging where we're at as a society and where we wanna go and what it's gonna take for us as individuals to acknowledge and change behavior that's ingrained in us, if that answers. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I think like from last um, conference that was, I mean, this is also the reason why we're having this conference too. Um, but then I kind of started to think about like, like, what is the difference between, you know, gender then like when you're hiring people and then you kind of look through their resume and then you kind of see their special skills and then for me, like oh, I, I moved from Korea, so that's kind of like a special. And then I don't know, some of you may have, you know, moved from East Coast or somewhere else. And that's a special thing. So why do we not consider gender as like one of those categories? And then why do we try to kind of kind of skew our perspective or weigh those issues way too much? Um, I think on the other hand, like we, I think this is all, this movement is all great. And then I think this is what it should be done. But maybe after we raise our voice and then we kind of show our visibility and then um, show the, celebrate the differences, but also celebrate similarities. Maybe next step was like, treat it as your favorite drink. <laughs> it varies like gin versus you know, a wine. Um, I don't know, maybe that will close the gap. And then I don't know if that makes sense for this question. 
Um, I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a question for Kay. How do you merge balance? Um, how do you merge and balance working for a company that has very specific design guidelines and freely expressing your creativity? Switching back and forth between the two must be hard. You merge and balance working with company that has very specific guidelines and freely expressing your creativity. So I guess this question is between my work versus my personal project uh, balance. Um, um, I mean, I feel like, I think it's kind of, it's like kind of correlated. Some of my, um, my personal side projects are influenced by my work. So sometimes they're very correlated and coexistent. So if I don't have one, then the, the other one cannot exist. So that's kind of the relationship that I embrace and how I, um, merge and balance is well sometimes uh, i should not tell my manager but um i try to work on this uh, <laughs> this um talk and then i spent uh in the from like five to i don't know 3 a.m and then i needed to sleep to uh, make it to my 9 a.m uh, meeting so sometimes it is off balance but if you want to do it then you kind of have to balance so I guess my short answer is like, if you want to do it, then you find a way to balance it. Awesome. Well, um, guys, somehow we are already out of time. It flew for me. Um, we're going to throw up a slide with um, just the websites and, and Instagrams of Claire and Kay in case you guys want to go, you know, keep track of what they're doing. Um, we also, you know, IDSA has an Instagram um, that we can drop in the chat. Uh, we would love it if you guys kept track of what we're doing too. You know, we'd love to keep seeing you at events and, and keep growing this with you. Um, Kay and Claire, I really can't thank you guys enough. I really, really appreciated everything you shared and how vulnerable and open you were. It was really wonderful. Um, and thanks to the whole IDSA board for all of your support and in helping this event happen. Um, I think we're just starting something that's gonna become really awesome.